everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks to the Fest for hosting me again. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, an honor to be here, and uh, I also have to thank you for making this possible again to see everybody uh, live, and also for the very nice logos that fits into presentations. Um, so, uh, my name is Giulia Bianchi. I'm a senior data scientist at Cyber Angel. Uh, I've been previously working for uh, Xabia, and this is where I became passionate about uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, so, the history about the fest is part of this game. Um, so, uh, to start, uh, an introduction to Cyber Angel and the activity. Uh, that we do there, and also this will be hel helpful to understand uh, the, pre the presentation, the topics I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so Cyber Angel, we scan the non-indexed internet, looking for uh, documents that are publicly uh, available and that may be sensitive documents for your company. Uh, so every day we retrieve billions of documents, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day uh, we have analysts that goes through the documents and decides whether they are uh, s sensitive or not, and if they are, they send them back, uh, they send an alert to the customers via a SAS interface. And the number of qualified alerts, it's very small. Um, in order to go from billions uh, of documents uh, to hundreds of uh, alerts, possible alerts, uh, there is a step of pre-processing that is there uh, not to overwhelm uh, the humans uh, with too much information. So this step of data processing consists in first uh, matching the documents with our customers' keywords, and then uh, there's a step of machine learning that is there to filter out uh, most of the documents that are just noise. Um, yes, that's it. And uh, just to give you an idea of the numbers, um, this is about five days uh, in July on one scope, so uh, it's uh, one model, uh, that treated and uh, discarded more than 50,000 alerts. Um, in the same five days, the analyst uh, scanned 5,000 documents they decided that 50 of them deserved to be further investigated, and among them they found 10 that were really sensitive uh, documents that were uh, used to alert their, uh, their owners. Um, so all of this, in all of these documents, one of the main challenges that we have uh, is that uh, information, the uh, leaks, are very rare among all these documents, and so it is hard for the model to uh, learn and learn uh, to learn from the data and detect those uh, those alerts. Um, to make you better understand why this is a problem, um, I'm gonna uh, tell you what is um, an unbalanced class problem in binary classification because uh, the machine learning model that we use is finally a binary class uh, classifier. Mm, first, the balanced class scenario. Um, so here on the left, imagine you have your training data uh, that is made of half of sensitive documents and half of non-sensitive documents. Uh, so it's 50-50, uh, and then uh, the model learns on this data, makes a prediction, and I pictured here uh, a possible prediction. Um, so the model said uh, that some documents are sensitive, and some of them are actually sensitive, and then the model said that some models are not, uh, some documents are not sensitive, and uh, most of them aren't. So overall, in this uh, in this scenario, the model made only two mistakes. And when we want to compute the performances, we can use the accuracy score. Uh, this is a measure that uh, considers all the well classified uh, documents over. Uh, over the full data set, so uh, it varies between zero and one, one being the best value. 
And so when you have a model with a 0.8 accuracy score, you can say that it, quite, uh, it worked quite well. Now, uh, the unbalanced class scenario. Uh, here on the left, instead of having 50-50 uh, repartition uh, among sensitive and non-sensitive documents, there is more like 10% sensitive documents and 90% non-sensitive documents. And let's suppose that the model makes this prediction on the, left, on the right. Uh, now, it says that one document is sensitive, but it was actually non-sensitive, so it's one mistake. And it says that the rest of the documents uh, is non-sensitive, uh, which is mainly right, but for one document that was, sens was actually sensitive. Now, here, if we compute the performances again and we use the same uh, accuracy score, well, the score is actually the same because there are only two mistakes, right? Um, but, okay, you, now you have the accuracy score that tells you that this is good, but when you take a look at the predictions, you know already that the model is actually, the second model is actually useless because your uh, objective is still to capture the sensitive documents. Now, that's a simple example on just uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 fake uh, documents, but uh, at a major scale, this is what happens uh, at CyberAngel for, for us. So how can we tackle the problem and uh, have a model that captures this, uh, uh, this uh, rare signal into the data? There are four uh, possible actions along the uh, machine learning pipeline. Um, I will talk about this straight away, but first, uh, just uh, to make a, the hypothesis that um, the data preparation, data collection, data cleaning, data exploration, and feature engineering, it's already done and it's good. Um, why do I say this? Because uh, actually, uh, having data that is representative, that is uh, of good quality, and uh, good feature engineering, is necessary for whatever machine learning problem. You will need to spend time on it, and uh, if you don't, uh, your model is probably not going to be performant uh, anyway. But to be specific to unbalanced class classification, uh, so you have these four, um, you have uh, these four options to try uh, to have your a better performant model. So during data preparation, you can try to restore, uh, restore the class balance. During model training, uh, you can try to update the class weight. During model evaluation, you're going to try to use a more appropriate metric. Uh, and we will see what I mean by more appropriate. And when you are at uh, final prediction, you can try to tweak uh, your probability threshold to make the final prediction. OK, so uh, first step. Uh, when we do machine learning is that we prepare the data and so uh, we said that we have like a very uh, small amount of positive class um, samples so we are going to try to restore the balance. What I mean by it is that um, you want to have your minority class to be more representative, more represent represented uh, into uh, your data set. So you have the option of adding uh, some sensitive documents, this is called oversampling, or the option of removing non-sensitive documents, and this is called undersampling. Um, okay, so when we do oversampling, uh, the idea is to add sensitive documents to your data set, but your problem in the first place is that you don't have enough. So it's not uh, as easy as, as it said, but there are two uh, techniques. One that is uh, pretty, pretty easy. Uh, you just randomly choose some of your uh, sensitive documents and you duplicate them. Um, why not? It's easy, but then the risk of overfitting is clearly very high. Um, overfitting being the problem of a model that learns by heart on your training data set and is not able to generalize on production data uh, for prediction. Uh, so easy but risky. Second option uh, is to uh, use a, 
a technique that it's called SMOTE, uh, which actually includes uh, some different techniques, but the idea is to just make up new, uh, new sensitive documents that are just uh, fake, actually. Um, so uh, you don't just do it randomly, of course, because it wouldn't make any sense, but uh, the, the idea behind it is that you have your sensitive documents, they have some features, um, that you have previously computed, and uh, you just vary a little bit these features uh, in a smart manner um, so that you increase the number of this minority class uh, into your training data set. Um, the problem that I see, I haven't tried it on our data um, for our use case at Cyber Angel, but the, mm, and we will, um, but the problem that I see here is that probably your training performances will be a bit better because it, the model actually sees more examples, but I'm not sure that in, at production, uh, on production data, it, it will work as well because uh, fake data, we will never we, maybe we will never see them in production. So this is something that uh, has to be tried but can be a bit tricky. Uh, this, the other technique is undersampling. Uh, undersampling is much easier because we have a lot of non-sensitive documents already. So if we remove some of them, well, maybe we, leave, we lose some information about uh, how a non-sensitive leak look like. Um, but it can help to uh, yeah, to improve, to increase the minority class proportion. Um, for our use case, um, in the beginning we were, we had like uh, zero point something, something per uh, percent of sensitive documents and we increased uh, their proportion to 10% uh, because we needed uh, the model to see some of the, some of some sensitive documents. Um, so, this is uh, about um, next step, so it's uh, model training. During model training, um, what we want to do is that we want to tell our model that making a mistake on the minority class is worse than making a mistake on the majority class. Okay, so uh, during model training, there is a loss function, a cost function that uh, it has to be minimized in order to find the final parameters of your model and having your uh, trained model. Um, so here, what I uh, the first uh, formula here uh, is the classical log loss uh, cost function that is used in logistic regression. Um, what it tells you, like here, you can see no difference between uh, how the positive class is treated against the, po the negative class. Um, so the first part of the formula, uh, y i is the real class for the positive class, for the negative class, and p i is the probability of the, uh, uh, the predicted, uh, the predicted uh, class for negative documents. Uh, so to, in order to have the model uh, uh, use, um, put more interest on uh, errors on the positive class, we introduce uh, these two weights, W1 and W0. Uh, and if we want it to work, we will have to have W1 greater than W0, otherwise it makes no sense. Um, so as I said, W0 is the weight for the majority class and W1 the weight for the minority class. Uh, now here it looks complicated, but actually uh, in um, scikit-learn, I use a lot of it, uh, and there it's possible also in other frameworks, but in scikit-learn, most of the models have a parameter that is called class weight, and it allows you to introduce these weights uh, into your training process. Um, this is something that we did for our model, and that uh, worked pretty well. Um, as a starting point, uh, as a starting value for your weights, you can use the inverse uh, of the number of samples that you have in your data set, uh, so that uh, it, um, uh, it works well in terms of W0 and W1. 
Uh, okay, so uh, during model evaluation, the idea is to choose a more appropriate metric. And what I mean by more appropriate metric, you will see in a moment. Um, this is a rock curve. This is a metric that is uh, pretty commonly used uh, for binary classification. Uh, what you have, what you see here on the, in the graph is that on the x-axis you have the false positive rate, on the y-axis you have the true positive rate. A random classifier, a classifier that just pick by chance uh, the class of each document, would have a rock curve that is the uh, diagonal uh, here in the plot. Uh, the uh, objective for a, for a classifier is to be uh, as close al as possible to uh, the top left corner. Uh, and in this top corner, what you have is a um, false positive rate that is zero and a true positive rate that is one. Uh, now, having a perfect classifier never happens. Uh, and if it happens to you, you should... Uh, think that you have a problem in your model, but um, to tend to this point, uh, you will need to try to maximize the true positives and the true negatives, because uh, if I say this, is because we see them, uh, the true negatives here and the true positive here, okay? So this is just uh, a mathematical um, um, co uh, consideration. And you will also need to minimize the false negatives and the false positives. Okay, and that's it. But we have an unbalanced class uh, situation in which true negatives, it's a number that is naturally high. This is because we have a lot of negative samples in the data set. So it's going to be easy to have a lot of, uh, of documents that are predicted as being negative and that, uh, and that are actually negative. False positive is naturally small because we have a very, very few positive samples. So what it means is that here, in the, yeah, sorry, here, um, this number is gonna be naturally small. To make you understand, let's go back to our very easy example in which we have balanced classes, right? Um, so uh, the model predicted a sensitive five documents, of which four are actually sensitive, and those are the true positives. And one document that, were, that was actually negative uh, is predicted as being positive. So this is a false positive. And vice versa, uh, for the uh, non-sensitive prediction, you have four documents that were actually negative, so those are the true negatives, and one document that is wrongly predicted as being non-sensitive, but it actually is. So this one is a false negative. If we take a look at the metrics that we just uh, described, the accuracy score, as before, uh, didn't change. It's 0 0.8 uh, out of 1. It's good. The false positive rate, we want it to be as close as possible to 0. Here, it's uh, value is 0.2, so the metric tells us that the model performs well again. And the true positive rate, uh, we want it to be as close as possible to 1. It's 0.8. So again, we have signs that the model is performs well. Okay, we knew it already, but uh, this is a confirmation that we are doing fine. In the unbalanced scenario, um, so the accuracy score 0.8, and so it tells us that the model is good. Uh, false positive rate is even uh, smaller than it was before. Uh, it's even closer to zero, so this tells us that the model is performing well. But then when we see the true positive rate that is zero, now we have a clear sign that the model is not working, right? Um, so uh, the accuracy score and the false positive rate have, are actually too optimistic. They, they tell us your model works fine and it doesn't. And if our model doesn't work well, we want to know. So uh, the true positive rate, it's there to, uh, to, to send an, a, a, an alarm, an alert. Um, 
second, uh, second metric that we can use is the precision recall curve. Um, uh, it's similar to the previous one, but it's different. So this time on the x-axis, you have the recall. Recall is actually another name for true positive rate, but for this curve, it's called recall. Um, and on the y-axis, uh, you have the precision. Now, a random classifier is the one that has a constant precision, precision to uh, 0 0.5 for whatever recall value. And uh, the perfect classifier now is the one that tends to the upper right point. Uh, in this point, you have a precision of 1 and a recall of 1. And uh, to obtain this value, now you will need to maximize the true positives, as before, uh, and to minimize the false negatives and false positives, as before. Uh, but this time, the true negatives that were giving us a biased vision of the false positive rate are not in the picture anymore. Um, so we have removed here um, a quantity that could bias and give us a too optimistic uh, value. Uh, let's go back to our favorite example. Um, so this is the first, uh, the first model with, class, with balanced classes. Uh, again, we have three metrics, and the three of them gives us a sign that the model performs well. Uh, now, it's just 10 uh, examples, and you may say that we don't need the metrics to to tell us that uh, the model is good, uh, but when you have uh, even just a thousand uh, samples in your data set, you're not going to go through it manually to see which one was well classified and which one it was not. So this is why uh, metrics are uh, interesting and useful. And when, it com when we compute precision and recall on, um, on the unbalanced uh, class model. Uh, well, now we have two metrics that are indicating uh, a very bad performance in the model. Um, and uh, again, if our model doesn't perform well, we, we want to know. We just don't want to have someone telling us it's good when it's not. Um, okay, so... Uh, the last step in, uh, uh, for a machine learning uh, pipeline is when you have uh, a, a trained model. Sorry for the microphone. Um, when you have a trained model and uh, you want to get your final predictions. This is, the mo this is why you, you have been working and doing all the stuff you've been doing before. Um, and uh, so to understand a little bit what I what I mean by probability threshold, uh, I need to take a step back and uh, talk about the outcome of um, uh, a trained model. A trained model is, a, is an object that has methods. Um, here I'm very into scikit-learn framework, uh, but you have the same also for TensorFlow, for example, uh, or XGBoost. Um, so, uh, first output you can get is uh, obtained by uh, mm, using method uh, predict proba. The creators of scikit-learn are French, so that's why the method is called predict proba and not just predict probs or something. Um, so, uh, predict proba uh, outputs a score that varies between zero and one. And if, uh, it, according to the model that you use, this may represent uh, really a probability, uh, it represents a probability. And uh, if it's well calibrated, then this probability represents the proportion of positive samples into your data set. The second, mo the second method that you have is uh, model.predict, uh, mm, and this one actually outputs a label. Uh, Normally, this is what you are interested in. Um, and uh, so you want to know if a document is sensitive or not. Um, by default, um, so this, sorry, this label uh, is going to be uh, 1 if the score is greater or equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 being the default value, and is 0 if the score is less than 0 0.5. 
Now, in the unbalanced scenario, 0.5 is not adapted uh, because there is not half of data that is sensitive. Um, so you, instead of uh, using directly uh, model predict, you may use predict proba and choose your own threshold. Um, so this is where it becomes uh, tricky. Not that it was easy before, but we can add a little bit of uh, spice here. Um, so the threshold that I've been telling you about, uh, the, the, the threshold you use, is going to change all of the quantities that we've been talking about until now. Uh, this is how uh, true positive, true negatives, etc., are computed. Imagine you have uh, a document that is uh, sensible, sensitive. It is scored 0.5. If you choose a threshold at 0.4, it's going to be um, predicted as being uh, sensitive, and so it's a true positive. If you choose uh, a threshold that is 0.6, it's going to be predicted as being non-sensitive, and in this case, it will be a false negative. Um, so, ways to choose a threshold. Um, you can uh, just consider a quantitative point of view. Uh, you, you say that you want the threshold that maximizes the precision, or you want to choose the threshold that maximizes uh, the, the false positive rate. Um, you can, and it, it's, you're going to have a result that is satisfactory or not. But what is going to help you to really uh, choose something uh, is the business meaning that you add to your metrics. So uh, you're going to have uh, to think about a more qualitative point of view um, and uh, uh, give business mean, uh, meaning in order to understand what it actually means for your use case to uh, prioritize uh, re recall or precision or whatever other metric. Um, now I'm going to try to give you some uh, concrete example of what it means uh, to translate precision and recall into Cyber Angel business language. Um, so we can do a more conservative choice or a less conservative choice. Uh, just uh, to recall, uh, you have to think about that our analysts, they have this interface, and in the interface, they receive a feed of documents, and they go click on them uh, one by one and decide if they are uh, sensitive or not. So if we make a conservative choice of uh, sending them um, quite, some, uh, quite some alerts, um, this choice is to be sure that all the leaks or the sensitive documents are into the feed. We want to make sure we don't lose any of them. Uh, but the, the volume may be too important. Uh, this means having higher recall and lower precision. Um, and so maybe the, 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 uh, the analysts still have too much stuff to go through. Um, so maybe the conclusion is that we need to hire another analyst in order to be able to go through all of them. Uh, this implies a cost. Uh, if we don't want to hire someone else, well, this implies maybe a burnout. Um, or maybe just an analyst that just doesn't go through all the feed, and then maybe we still miss some of the leaks uh, that we are supposed to send to our customers. Uh, when we make a less conservative, um, more conservative, a less conservative choice, <laughs> meaning that um, we uh, remove um, a lot of documents, then we know that we may miss some of the leaks into uh, into the documents that we don't show to the analysts. This means having a higher precision and a lower recall. So this, the feed, the feed is smaller. Uh, it can be. Uh, treated by less analysts, um, but then we may miss something, uh, something that we didn't even show to the person that is supposed to detect the leak. So this may translate in a, a loss of customers and a loss of money uh, in the end. Um, 
So uh, this is the kind of reasonment that can really help you to decide whether uh, what is the, the best scenario for you in your use case. Okay, so just uh, an example. Uh, we are at the fest, so it's nice to, take, to look at code. Um, this is not uh, what happens at Cyber Angel and what I'm going to show you. Um, it's a Kaggle, uh, a Kaggle data set. Uh, nothing new here. Um, the, the use case uh, consists in um, textual data. Uh, so you have people requesting a pizza for free and people saying, yes, I'm going to give you a pizza, or no, I'm not. I'm not going to give you a free pizza. Uh, so here, the proportion of uh, positive class, positive being, I'm going to pay you a pizza, uh, it's almost 25%. And the, uh, so and people who didn't receive a pizza was around 75% uh, in, in the data set. Uh, this is a very, very uh, simple uh, feature engineering step up above here. Uh, it's uh, um, TF-IDF transformation. The only thing you need to know at the moment is that it allows to transform textual data into numerical data that can be used by the model uh, to learn. Then uh, you have a step that is just the instantiation uh, of the model. Um, and then you can create your pipeline in which you have um, the feature engineering and the classifier. Uh, we have fit, we fit the pipeline to training data. Um, and then we go compute uh, the probabilities, as I uh, told you before, uh, and we do so on the test data. Of course, we leave some data out to, uh, to check the performances of the model. Um, then, uh, and then I compute the predicted class uh, based on a threshold that I just left out in order to be able to use uh, some values. And then I can go uh, compute precision recall, um, accuracy score, uh, this is just a few, but you can compute all the uh, metrics that you want. Uh, another, just another disclaimer, there's not even a cross-validation here, a step, but it's really just for the, for the example. And you will see the models don't perform that well, but it's just there to show you. Um, so um, I, I chose um, a multinomial naive bias model that was that was one trained with a default threshold of 0 0.5. And then second time, uh, I used uh, the, um, uh, a threshold of 24.6 uh, uh, because it's the actual proportion of positive samples in the data set. Um, and in this case, in these two, uh, if we compare these two, uh, we have an accuracy score that in the first case, it's 0.75, and in the second case, it's 0.59. So if you take only a look at these two metrics, uh, now you can tell that the first one is too optimistic, uh, and the second one is more reliable, telling us that uh, the model doesn't work well, and this can be <laughs> seen uh, into the other, uh, into with the other metrics. So there's not really... Um, a surprise, but um, you know, here in the first case, we have a high accuracy uh, precision that is um, not exciting, a recall that is really not exciting, and the FPR that is very exciting. On the other hand, so uh, we, we you need to take a look at the right at the right thing, and uh, remember what you are talking about, what you have in your data, uh, to interpret those. Uh, then I trained a logistic regression with a default threshold of 0 0.5, and uh, it's just to, to compare with the logistic regression where uh, I used the class um, I used the, to restore the class balance. Um, so this is a default value uh, uh, that is quite useful to start with. Um, and again, 
uh, we see an accuracy that is high uh, for the default values and an accuracy that is lower uh, with the uh, new value. So, um, so here, even if, even if we use the class, uh, the class weight parameter, uh, you realize that you still have some work to do to improve the model. Um, but, but that's it. At least the, the, at least the numbers are telling you, uh, are really telling you what to do next. They are not telling you what to do next. They are telling you that you are not going, doing fine. But it's already a good starting point. Uh, now, these are the rock curve and the precision recall curve for the three models. Um, well, what we can say here is that the models are better than the random choice. <laughs> good, but still not uh, that good. We would like them to be clearly uh, better performing. Uh, but this, this, this kind of, of graphs helps you compare the models and get an idea of how, how, it's, how it's going. And uh, another uh, plot that can help you decide, here uh, you have the representation of precision and recall uh, each time in the same plot. Recall is the gr uh, green one and precision is the violet one. And it's uh, the values of precision recall by a threshold. Okay, so here you can you can use this kind of plots uh, to see what happens to your metrics if you use one threshold or another. Um, okay, um, so final uh, final point. Um, always always spend time on the due diligence, uh, qu data quality, uh, feature engineering. Uh, we all usually say that we spend 80% of the time on these steps and 20% of the modeling. Uh, it's always a good investment. Uh, otherwise, you may end up with a model that has some performances you don't even know why, and you will need to go back to your data exploration and stuff. So this is always uh, well-invested time. Then pay attention to performances that are too optimistic. If your model doesn't perform well, you want to know it. Um, you can uh, have fun and combine and test all the different technical solutions I've been talking to you about. Um, you can also create your own personalized metrics uh, that are adapted to your use case. Um, and then, yeah, there's no like uh, magic. Uh, solution, uh, you have to check what works on your data and on your use case. Um, always remember to interpret the results, uh, otherwise um, what can happen is that the, the business won't listen to you. <laughs> the, making them understand what you are doing uh, is what uh, is going to keep them interesting, interested in what you are doing and using what you do. And of course, uh, enjoy the ride together. Um, that would be it for me. Uh, so if you have questions, it's time. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, how many data scientists are here? Nice. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank you for this presentation first. Second, uh, my questions are not about how you have treated your problem. My questions are about the problem initialization itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is lo looks like an animal detection. Is that? Uh, uh, what? My, the problem. No, uh, okay. Je ne comprends pas compris la question. Uh, la, le mot. The problem looks like anomaly detection. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, why should we use supervised learning instead, instead of semi-supervised learning, especially uh, if you don't have enough amount of data? 
Well, it's a, it's an option to use uh, um, self-supervised. Uh, that's what you semi-supervised learning. Yes, uh, it's an option, but. Um, uh, this is um, so the, the the models that we put in place. Uh, it's an iterative process. So this is what we started with. Um, it, the the fact of using um, balanced uh, weight, for example, it's already an improvement compared to what we uh, were doing before. And so one of the next steps is to try smote uh, to see if oversampling may work for us. And uh, it, it's it's an next steps. It could be uh, your suggestion. Um, what we need to check is the amount of time that we need to develop it uh, compared to the the output. If it, there's a real yeah, um, not a real gain, but like a, a gain that is uh, enough to justify um, the development that we're going. And yes, uh, so I gave like uh, four options, but yes, th there may be more, of course. Okay. I have another question. Uh, may we use machine learning to classify documents? Is machine learning able to be using with unstructured data? I would say yes if you uh, use the IDF to transform your data to numerical data. But regarding the IF or word to vec or anything else, uh, does they really save the meaningfulness of a word do we uh, have the capability, by example, to see the polarity of a word using these transformation techniques? Uh, I, don't, I didn't understand, sorry. So you are talking about unstructured data? If, if our model is able to use the unstructured data? I suppose the question is, is machine learning capable to classify the data non structure déjà de 1? Je peux dire oui, comme vous, ouais. vous avez utilisé le TF, TFIDF. Ouais. Mais ma question est, est-ce que, en utilisant TFIDF ou bien word to vec ou bien n'importe quelle technique, est-ce que euh, ces techniques euh, sauvegardent sauvegarde bien les, euh, les meaningfulness euh, pour, pour un mot Est-ce qu'on peut, par exemple, mesurer la polarité ah. du mot en utilisant ces techniques, ces transformations uh, Ok. Euh, donc le TFIDF, là, c'était utilisé vraiment que pour l'exemple. Euh, donc on peut euh, l'avoir utilisé. Après, euh, ce que tu me dis, j'ai l'impression que ça va aussi dans le sens de l'interprétabilité euh, de résultats et de features qu'on sort. Euh, on regarde, on regarde euh, les features importance et c'est quoi qui, qui porte euh, le plus de, euh, de valeur au modèle euh, alors, concernant vraiment, est-ce qu'on sait si un mot ou l'autre euh, a joué dans, le, dans la classification euh, Alors, je ne suis pas sûre qu'on soit arrivé jusque-là. Mais, enfin, euh, alors, word embeddings ou choses comme ça, on n'a pas, pas encore utilisé, au moins, ce n'est pas en production. Euh, quand on fait du, du, du traitement de texte, euh, il y a quand même pas mal de travail de nettoyage de texte en amont pour pouvoir vraiment euh, garder que les informations euh, enfin, les, plus, les plus importantes. Quoi. Je ne sais pas comment vraiment <rire> quantifier ça. Mais euh, oui, on évite de faire des choses où on perd complètement euh, euh, l'idée de ce qui est en train de se passer dans le, dans le modèle. Quoi. Et après, les modèles, il y a aussi du, enfin, du XGBoost, par exemple. Donc, ce n'est pas des modèles qui sont hyper compliqués à interpréter derrière, entre autres. Merci. Bonjour. Vous avez indiqué le risque d'avoir un modèle overfit, donc qui soit très bon pour les données d'entraînement, mais au final, pas très bon pour les données réelles. Comment on peut l'évaluer, ça Parce que finalement, les faux négatifs, on ne les voit pas. En fait, euh, l'overfit, de manière générale, comme on, euh, on peut le détecter, c'est quand on a le, notre jeu de données d'entraînement et le jeu de données de test. Le jeu de données de test, c'est un jeu de données dont on connaît les vraies, les vraies classes, mais qu'on n'utilise pas pour entraîner. Et donc, on peut calculer, on peut entraîner sur le modèle, sur le, les jeux de données d'entraînement. Et là, on va avoir de super performances. 
Et sur le jeu de données de test, quand on va vérifier les faux positifs ou négatifs, etc., on va voir que les performances chutent. Et là, tu es sûr que tu as du overfit. Euh, après, en production, effectivement, une fois que le modèle est en place, nous, on ne sait plus si euh, tout ce qu'on on élimine, euh, c'était vraiment des faux négatifs ou pas. Et donc, en fait, ce qu'on fait, c'est que on, on, pour monitorer ça, on, parmi tout ce qu'on élimine, on récupère 5% des alertes euh, des documents au hasard et on les propose, on les met quand même dans le, dans le feed des analystes. Et donc on va vérifier sur ce 5% euh, s'il y a eu des choses qui ont été envoyées ou pas. Et comme ça, on peut estimer euh, à peu près si, euh, euh, si on est bon ou pas. Merci. Bonjour. Euh, Aujourd'hui, est-ce que vous fonctionnez avec justement un jeu de modèle, enfin un jeu de données d'entraînement pour tous vos clients, euh, ou alors euh, chaque client va dire ok pour moi ce qui est important, le genre de suite que je peux avoir, c'est tel type de document technique ou tel type de données de mes propres clients. Euh, comment on euh, Alors on a euh, plusieurs modèles selon euh, plutôt le scope. Mais euh, parce qu'on peut avoir euh, différents types de documents, on n'utilise pas le même modèle pour différentes choses. Euh, par contre, on utilise dans un même scope, on utilise le même modèle. Ce qu'on personnalise après, c'est les thresholds. Euh, il y a des clients qui euh, euh, sont au courant que, euh, je sais pas, qu'il y a des choses qui sont, qui sont un peu toujours là et qui n'ont pas envie d'être alertés euh, tous les 5 minutes. Et donc, on choisit un threshold qui est haut. Euh, voilà. C'est comme ça qu'on personnalise par rapport aux clients. Bonjour. Ça met combien de temps un analyste à gérer un document Oh, c'est hyper rapide. Enfin, c'est impressionnant. Euh, alors, euh, je n'ai pas les chiffres en tête, mais euh, j'ai fait des vie ma vie d'analyste et c'est assez impressionnant. La plupart des choses, avec un coup d'œil, ils savent que ce n'est pas, pas sensible. sensible. Euh, après, quand, par exemple, une façon qu'ils ont de travailler, c'est de euh, cocher euh, tout, euh, cocher tout. Ils regardent et ils décochent ce qui leur semble un peu intéressant. Comme ça, après, ils dégagent tout ce qu'ils ont coché et ils prennent plus de temps pour ce qu'ils ont laissé dans leur feed pour y passer un peu plus de temps. Euh, mais c'est euh, vraiment assez impressionnant à voir. <rire> De, du coup, le, le milliard de documents ou millions de documents, c'est les. Qu'est-ce que tu appelles documents C'est des mots, euh, des, des um, lots de textes découpés ou c'est. Euh... Euh, en fait, c'est. Euh, alors, euh, je suis, je suis pas dans cette équipe et c'est pas hyper longtemps. Je suis, je suis assez Bill Angel, mais euh, en fait, euh, de ma compréhension, euh, on a ce qui s'appelle l'équipe harvesting qui vraiment va interroger. Euh, des serveurs, euh, des euh, baquettes euh, cloud, et en fait, tout ce qu'ils retrouvent sur euh, ou des databases, et tout ce qui est ouvert et qu'ils arrivent à télécharger, ils le téléchargent. Donc, euh, documents, ça peut être euh, plein de choses. Euh, ils peuvent avoir des PDF, des images, de, des CSV. Euh, euh, donc, c'est assez... C'est vraiment pas homogène. Et il n'y a pas du, encore fois, il n'y a pas du hacking de notre part. C'est des choses qui se trouvent sur Internet parce que quelqu'un les a mis à un moment donné, de façon volontaire ou pas. Euh, mais nous, juste, on les trouve. Bon, je crois que on est bon. Merci beaucoup. J'espère que ça vous a plu. <rires>